Today, and thank you to everyone for coming out this morning to hear my talk. I'd like to begin the discussion of my book today by taking us back in time. Imagine, it's August 1942, and we're attending a Socialist Workers' Party meeting in Seattle. A script for a radio play entitled Enemies Within is being circulated among the members. Funds are being raised to support the defense of the 18 Trotskyists, many of whom were also members of Minneapolis Teamsters Local 544, who had been convicted under the Smith Act less than a year earlier in December of 1941. Should I keep going? Yeah. yeah. Oh. <laughs> we need to put up that little technical problem. Please wait. <laughs> That's probably easiest, yeah. And I also have to switch this thing there for the page. Well, actually, I could, what I could do is just take this back off. Right off. Yeah, because otherwise you'll get feedback if you have them right next to each other. Okay. Take that one away. Okay. Is that better? Yeah. yeah. Okay, great. So, back to Seattle in 1942 in an SWP meeting, and perhaps a reading of the play took place that evening, so let's sit back and enjoy the performance. First, we hear a narrator named Anne, who we quickly identify as the authoritative voice of an anxious American citizen. She reminds us that today, as never before, our country is in danger as it fights fascism around the globe. She implores us to not forget the enemies within and to remember how France fell, remember the fifth column, reassuring us of the FBI's stellar work in uncovering such dangerous foes, uncovering the undercover agents of foreignisms, which would overthrow our government by force and violence, and introduces a special guest into the studio, Henry Schwinnout, the special assistant to the US Attorney General who aided in the prosecution of the 18 Trotskyists. We then hear the character of Schwinnout explain the background to the Minneapolis case from the government's perspective as an example of a real fifth column threat. We hear harp music as the play moves into a satirical imaginary cutaway featuring an exchange between Vincent Dunn, Trotskyist and leader of Teamsters Local 544, and Roy Wienick. In Schwinnout's recounting, Dunn is found sitting in a darkened basement surrounded by subversive literature waiting to pull Wienick into an evil plot by letting him in on the Trotskyists' real purpose. Now remember my exact words, Dunn says to the man who would become one of the government's chief witnesses. They may be useful to you someday. We have got to overthrow the government by force and violence. That will be all for today, Wienick. With Wienick's departure from the imaginary scene, the character of James Bartlett enters Dunn's darkened chamber. Cast as an illiterate gun-toting buffoon, Bartlett asks Dunn, you ain't going to tell me more stuff about overthrowing the government by force and violence again, boss, are you? His offer to use his sidearm in the alleged planned uprising is rebuffed by Dunn, however, who explains what the real ammunition for the revolution will be. Literature, stinker literature. This is the stuff that will really do the job. And so we hear the alleged origins of the nefarious plot explained by Schwinnout's dramatically imagined narrative. Thus, in the dark of night, in the nooks and crannies of Minneapolis, Schwinnout explains to Anne, in the union meetings, in the hotel halls, the sinister conspiracy was hatched. Next, we hear Anne, the narrator, explain that we will now hear Schwinnout in conversation with journalist I.F. Stone. We hear Schwinnout explain the evidence that the government had of the Trotskyists' alleged ability to overthrow the government by force. Local 544's Union Defense Guard and its mock drill in 1938, which ended up with a trip to a burlesque theater. Cue harp music again as we join Schwinnout in an imaginary recreation of the scene. There we hear Nick Wagner, another union member, mustering the men, and Bartlett taking the comrades roll call. Anderson off, here. Boleski, here. O'Connoreski, here. Vincent Dunovich, here. Grant Dunovich, here. Anne intervenes to explain to the listeners, thus they stood assembled, 100 evil-looking men armed with rubber truncheons, armbands, and that insidious propaganda tract, the three unexpurgated volumes of Marxist capital, men ready for anything without conscience, without morals. We then hear as Wagner leads the men into the Gaiety Theater, follow me men quietly now, he says, 
the sound of honky-tonk music coming from inside the establishment. <laughs> the anime within, which also includes a lengthy spoof of the trial itself, ends with a final dramatization of interviews with the average American patriotic citizen to see what he or she thinks of the Minneapolis case. A Mr. J.P. Morganpuss, a broker, opines, America will not tolerate people like that. If they don't let the, like this country, let them go back to where they came from. As the voice of right-wing sentiment, Morgan Puss states, all labor organizers are dangerous radicals. Shooting is too good for them. Indeed, when a teamster tries to speak next and begins to praise the idea of the Union Defense Guard, he's cut off, proverbially gagged by Anne, who shrieks, how did that guy get in here? Quickly, the microphone is handed over to Daniel Tobin, president of the International Brotherhood of Teamsters, who summarizes the position of those who had come to support the Smith Act and its first use against the Trotskyists. While our country is in a dangerous position, these disturbers who believe in the politics of foreign radical governments must be in some way prevented from pursuing their dangerous course. Anne ends the program by reinforcing Tobin's sentiments. And so we see that Americans, unanimous in their condemnation of those who would overthrow the government by force and violence, stand together in demanding the conviction of these men. Pulling back from this commentary, however, is an anonymous announcer whose satirical expression of gratitude to the program's fictional sponsor, Jim Crow Blackout Paper, voices the final critique of the entire affair leading up to including the trial from the point of view of the Trotskyist creators of the enemies within. Throughout the history of our great nation, Jim Crow has stood for darkness, and now for complete darkness, for total blackout, it's more than ever Jim Crow. The Enemies Within was thus a satire of the fifth column fear that had fueled the passage of the Smith Act and a farcical recreation of the events that led to the prosecution of the Trotskyists. Through its dark humor, it voiced a perspective on the case held by many Trotskyists, that the prosecution was an absurd witch hunt aided by ignorant dupes of Tobin and witnesses coached by the FBI that ultimately blacked out the civil rights of the defendants and threatened the civil liberties of all Americans. But the play also reveals the creative side of some Trotskyists who did their best to keep a sense of humor during an otherwise difficult period in their history. Indeed, those familiar with the specifics of the case would have found these details and the portrayals of the individuals involved deliciously funny. Even during some of their darkest hours, here as they pursued an appeal of the conviction of the 18 under the Smith Act, the Trotskyists managed to find a way to laugh and to keep on fighting. Given what they had just experienced in the year before this play was circulated at the branch meeting in Seattle, and given what they would continue to face in the coming years and decades as targets of the nation's growing domestic security state, their resilience and commitment to their cause and to their right to freely advocate it was all the more remarkable. My book, Trotskyists on Trial, Free Speech and Political Persecution Since the Age of FDR, tells the history of their decades-long struggle. Now, before I walk us through some of the specifics of the book at the chapter level, I would like to first lay out some of the work's overarching goals and themes. Exploring the social, political, and legal history of the first Smith Act case, this book charts the compromise many Americans were willing to make between free speech and national security during wartime, and probes the implications of that choice for dissent and democracy in mid to late 20th century American society. Until relatively recently, such a comprehensive history of the first Smith Act case has not been possible. Uh, until my book was published, there, were, there was, no, was no book, and only three articles, two which were written in the 1960s and one in 2011. Uh, with declassified government documents becoming available and recently opened archival sources, it made possible the fuller and more historically grounded story that explains the implications of the case for organized labor and for civil liberties in wartime and post-war America. Because the origins of this first Smith Act case can be found partly in the actions of a rank and file opposition movement formed in late 1940 against local 544's Trotskyist dominated leadership, its history fits within the story of early labor anti-communism. That is, opposition to communism within the ranks of labor during the late 1930s and early 1940s. What sets this case apart, however, are the ties between that local rank and file opposition and the FBI something that has been less, well, thoroughly, less thoroughly probed in the literature. This book provides a case study of the relationship between such early labor anti-communists and the developing security state. It demonstrates how some working class Americans welcomed federal investigations into their internal union disputes, 
a disquieting reality not yet fully explored by labor historians, particularly for this earlier period. Yet in Minneapolis, men like Thomas Williams, James Bartlett, and their supporters in the opposition group they formed, known as the Committee of 100, worked to oust Vincent Dunn and the other Trotskyist leaders of Local 544 because of those leaders' radical politics. The committee cooperated with the FBI's investigation of the SWP, transforming the struggle for control of the union from a local squabble into a federal criminal case. In addition to deepening our understanding of early labor anti-communism, illuminating in particular the role of the FBI, this study of the 1941 Smith Act case engages with broader issue, the broader issue of how the state balanced the competing claims of civil liberties and national security just before and during World War II. Under Acting Attorney General Francis Biddle, the Roosevelt administration oversaw the prosecution of the Trotskyists beginning in June 1941. This action was the first time since 1798 that the United States put defendants on trial for sedition while the nation was not at war. The deci decision to go ahead with the case illuminates how even self-described civil libertarians like Biddle participated in curtailing free speech. This book thus complements existing works on the civil liberties violations that took place under the Roosevelt administration. The Minneapolis case, however, shows how far the administration went to prosecute political dissent, even to the point of targeting the labor liberal left. It reveals how strong fear of a fifth column activity became on the eve of the war, and how figures like Biddle allowed that fear to trump their defense of free speech rights. The case legitimized both the Smith Act and, as one contemporary observer noted, its punishment of mere political advocacy. First implemented in this way in 1941, the Smith Act re remained in full force for the next 16 years. It served as the statutory basis for many of the prosecutions of the Second Red Scare, most notably that of the Communist Party leadership in 1949. While it remained unchallenged by the Supreme Court until 1957, which I'll talk more about later, uh, the Smith Act contributed to the chilling of political dissent during the early Cold War years. The Trotskyists continued to fight for the repeal of the Smith Act and attempted, in the face of employer and union blacklisting and intense FBI surveillance, to revive the SWP as a revolutionary workers' party. My book also examines this struggle, which illuminates the history of both free speech law and radical political activism during the latter half of the 20th century and demonstrates the promises and limitations of each. The central issue that the 1941 Smith Act case speaks to of how Americans have tolerated or suppressed dissent among moments of national crisis is not only important to our understanding of the period around World War II, but also remains a pressing concern in the post 9-11 world. Americans were willing in the past to place limits on First Amendment rights in the context of perceived grave and imminent threats to the nation's security, and they have been willing to do so again now with the Patriot Act as the country finds itself in a state of perpetual war on terror. This study traces some of the implications of this compromise between rights and security that was made in the mid-20th century, offering historical context for some of the consequences of similar bargains struck today. The story of the first Smith Act case is thus a deeply rooted and far-reaching one. I begin the book by examining those roots. Chapter one examines the militant backgrounds of several of the defendants that were expressed during the 1934 Minneapolis Teamsters strike, the 1938 creation of local 544's Union Defense Guard, and this was a group of about 600 union members, armed union members who were organized to defend themselves and the union against attacks by the fascist silver shirts. Uh, and I also look at the 1939 Works Progress Administration strike in which several of these Trotskyists were involved. The story of the 34 strikes is a fairly well-known one, especially since the publication of Brian Palmer's recent book, Revolutionary Teamsters. And so I don't delve too deeply into the specific contours of that moment in my book. Instead, after providing many biographies of some of the key figures in this history, including uh, Vincent Dunn, who you see here, a famous photograph of him during the strike, uh, Carl Scogland, Farrell Dobbs, Harry DeBoer, and James Cannon, and situating their lives in the young and evolving Communist Party left opposition, 
I trace out the significance of the 1934 strikes, both for the gains achieved uh, for the workers in breaking what had been an open shop town, and for the significance of the Trotskyist leadership in securing that victory. The ability of those leaders to shut down the city and lead the drivers and their supporters in trades ac across the city through months of struggle, struggle that was uh, often violently opposed by the Citizens Alliance and the police, that later put those Trotskyists on the radar of the Justice Department as potential threats to national security. Their alleged ability to shut down trucking throughout the entire Midwest and thus disrupt Roosevelt's war preparedness program was the fear. I argue in chapter one that the perception of this association between the Trotskyist revolutionary politics and their placement as leaders in an important and as in important and influential uh, in roles in the Teamsters Union in Minneapolis as a potential threat to national security was reinforced by the anxiety surrounding the 1938 creation of that Union Defense Guard. The existence of the Union Defense Guard would be interpreted by the FBI and the prosecution in 1941 as the alleged kernel of a proletarian army set on overthrowing the government by force during the crisis of the war. The government also asserted the Trotskyist alleged dangerous influence within the union movement in its prosecution of Max Gelderman, Edward Palmquist, and others who were members of the SWP's uh, uh, Federal Workers Section and their involvement in the 1939 WPA strikes. Those individuals were convicted of conspiracy in a case that essentially equated criticism of government policy, they were protesting relief cuts, uh, with subversion. And that argument would come back to haunt local 544 and the Trotskyists in the 1941 Smith Act trial. And the same US attorney, Victor Anderson, uh, made the case in the 39 trial. He would be the US attorney prosecuting the case in 1941 before the same judge, Matthew Joyce, in 1939 and again in 1941. So poor Geldman and Palmquist, they were sent to jail twice by this guy. Chapter one also explores the other side of the background to the 1941 case, and that's the changing national political landscape of the late 30s and early 40s, when as the war broke out and spread across Europe, America became gripped by a growing fear of fifth column subversion and a little red scare that resulted in the passage of the Smith Act. Such anxieties were mocked in the satire of the enemies within, but they had very real purchase during the summers of 1939 and 1940, when the bill that became the Smith Act was debated in hearings first in the House, uh, where it was introduced by its sponsor, Congressman, a uh, Virginia Congressman Howard Smith. Uh, this is him. Oh, thank you. Very much. <laughs> a little delay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and then uh, in the Senate, in the summer of 1940, uh, one senator argued in the summer of 1940 when the bill came before the Senate, uh, and this was after the blitzkrieg of the spring, a year ago this provision, and there was a provision in the bill for fingerprinting and registering immigrants, that provision might have been re rejected, but we now know that the modern technique of war involves fifth columns. Smith agreed with this, arguing that the government needed to know something about who the alien is within our gates uh, and something about him lest he be beholden to a foreign enemy. So the proposed bill that took Smith's name, the Smith Act, included not only the first peacetime sedition statute, making it illegal to advocate the violent overthrow of the government, or to disrupt the armed forces, or to belong to an organization that did the same, or to publish or distribute information that did the same. It also included these provisions for fingerprinting and registering aliens, and provisions to deport those who espoused radical political views. In fact, the official name of the Smith Act is the Alien Registration Act. Its supporters from within the armed forces, various self-described patriotic organizations and veterans groups, including the American Legion, saw such an omnibus law as essential for preserving American democracy. This became the argument that they made, that it was important to restrict speech. We can't have absolute free speech in this time of crisis. Others, most notably Osmond Frankel of the ACLU, who testified on the Hill against the bill, vehemently disagreed, uh, making the case that it was especially during such dangerous times that civil liberties needed to be preserved. Vito Marcantonio, who was the only senator to speak out against the bill uh, on the, from the Senate floor, agreed with Frankel and argued that 
it seems to me that in a period as trying as is this period, the test of democracy lies in the ability of that democracy to maintain its liberties, to preserve those liberties, and to have more freedom rather than less freedom during the period of crisis. He warned that he was fearful that under the guise of supporting and maintaining our American way of life, by this type of legislation, we are taking steps with seven league boots towards the establishing in America, in free America, the slave-like institutions of Nazi Germany. And yet the bill passed as the majority in both the House and Senate, caught up in the fear of the fifth column in the Little Red Scare, sided with Smith and voted yay. President Roosevelt signed the bill into law on January 29, 1940, seven days after the fall of France, without protest. Indeed, by then, FDR had already begun to expand the power and reach of what was becoming the nation's domestic security state, another theme I trace out in the book. Beginning in 1934, when he ordered J. Edgar Hoover, director of the FBI, to uh, investigate for, uh, the foreign ties of fascist organizations in the United States, and growing with his order in 1936 to include left-wing groups as well, Roosevelt had already left behind the policy to ban all domestic political spying that had been established by former Atten Attorney General Harlan Fisk Stone in 1924 after the abuses of the first Red Scare. Stone essentially said the FBI should not be in the business of investigating people's politics, it should be investigating crimes. And that ban stayed from 24 until Roosevelt gave a verbal mandate to Hoover to begin investigating first right-wing groups with foreign ties, then left-wing groups with foreign ties, and then by 1939, uh, FDR authorized Hoover to coordinate the domestic investigations of any groups that engaged in subversion or sabotage regardless of any foreign ties or connections. And Hoover, not surprisingly, eagerly responded to this. Uh, he launched investigations into groups around the country, including the SWP. Uh, he also created the custodial detention list in 1939 that kept track of those with strong communist or Nazi tendencies. And Vincent Dunn and Farrell Dobbs were just two of many individuals who were added to that list. They were categorized according to their level of dangerousness with those deemed most threatening identified for detention if America entered the war. They basically could be rounded up and imprisoned. After I lay out this broad and deep background to what will become the 1941 trial, I move in chapter two to explore the immediate context for the case in the internal workings of Local 544 in Minneapolis. This chapter analyzes the relationship between the anti-communist rank and file movement within the Teamsters Local 544 and the FBI that turned an internal union fight into a criminal case by the summer of 1941. It explores the complexity of such early labor anti-communism within the context of the deepening crisis of the war in Europe and uh, Roosevelt's expanding war preparedness plan at home. And it reveals the role of the Justice Department and the FBI in selecting Local 544 and the SWP as the first targets of the Smith Act because of the alleged threat they pose to national security. I thus look into the backgrounds of two of the key figures in this internal union uh, opposition movement, the anti-communist rank and file members, James Bartlett and Tommy Williams, and somewhat controversially try to understand their point of view. Uh, and here I have a picture of um, James Bartlett when, when he was still in the SWP before he turned on uh, his comrades uh, with his wife visiting Trotsky along with Harry DeBoer and his wife and this was in 1940. By late 1940, early 41, Bartlett had broke with the Trotsky's leadership in Minneapolis and became one of the leaders of this opposition movement. And here I tread on rather uncomfortable ground, but ground I feel I need to explore as a labor historian, the place where such workers like Bartlett and Williams could constitute a politically, and indeed I believe for some like Sidney Brennan, uh, a socially conservative movement within an other, otherwise progressive, indeed radical union. These men have been vilified in the existing narratives of the case because their actions are quite despicable. They are the men who first kicked up a fuss within the union as they created this committee of 100 in early 1941 to protest what they argued was the Trotskyist leadership's churning local 544 into an arm of the SWP. They claimed that they were selling 
party literature in the union hall, that they were pressuring uh, union officers to contribute 10% of their salary to the party and so on. Bartlett and Williams and Brennan then reached out to the International Brotherhood of Teamsters to, and demanded an investigation of the locals. So they first went to the IBT uh, and they did this on the basis of the IBT's recently passed ban on communist union leaders. The IBT had passed a ban on communist leaders in September of 1940. And so Bartlett and Williams and Brennan thought they were on good ground to appeal to the international to come in and investigate these radical leaders of their local uh, and they hoped that that would clean them out. Okay, when that didn't work, ultimately they cooperated with the FBI, uh, even as the Bureau was simultaneously infiltrating the Union, something I have records of showing taking place as early as August of 1940. So the FBI was already investigating Local 544 at the same time as this in indigenous anti-communist rank and file movement was emerging, and then they started cooperating. So rather than writing these men off completely, I try to explain the complexity of their evolving identities and politics in the context of the deepening Little Red Scare, as well as the factors of their personal desires and grudges that drove their campaign for control of the Union. Ultimately, I argue, on, based on sources I found in the National Archives, that the story of how the first Smith Act trial evolved out of this internal Union struggle was in many ways much, much bigger than the efforts of men like Bartlett, Williams, and Brennan. Indeed, I argue it was even bigger than the efforts of Daniel Tobin, who in the existing narratives is often blamed uh, for the Justice Department's decision to indict the 29 Trotskyists in July of 1941 because of what has been termed the political debt theory. That theory holds that because Tobin, as president of the IBT and close supporter of FDR, got out the labor vote for Roosevelt, Roosevelt then paid back that political debt by greenlighting the prosecution of the Trotskyists after receiving a telegram from Tobin on June 12th, 1941, in which Tobin uh, uh, made the case for the Trotskyists' alleged dangerousness and threat to national security. And Tobin did this on June 10th because a few days before, on June 9th, the Trotskyist leaders of Local 544 brought to the members uh, a, 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 a demand that Tobin had made on them to impose a receivership over the local. Tobin was responding to that internal uh, union investigation that Bartlett and Brennan were pushing for, and he met with the Trotskyist leaders in Washington in early June and said, look, there are complaints from these men that you're turning the local into an arm of the party, you need to stop that, you need to step away from the party, and we're gonna, we wanna put a receivership over your local. And Dunn and Dobbs and the others said, no, we're not going, we won't accept that. Our union is a democratic union, we have to take this back to our members. And they did, and they brought it to a vote on June 9th, and the membership voted to pull out of the IBT and affiliate with the CIO. So now there were two local 544s in Minneapolis, one affiliated with the AFL that was loyal to Tobin and where Bartlett and Brennan uh, and the anti-communist rank and file movement were, and local 544 CIO that was headed by the Trotskyists. After that split, Tobin wrote this telegram to Roosevelt making the case that the Trotskyists were a threat to national security. This is the reason why it's often pointed to that's then what is believed to have triggered the uh, uh, raids and arrests that came later in June and the indictments that came in July. What I try to argue is that Tobin's telegram was a part of a larger story. It certainly gave FDR political cover to uh, launch the raids and arrests to approve of that investigation. He could now say he was invited in. But it, the telegram, I argue, wasn't the sole or, or determining factor of the decision to prosecute. What I show in chapter two is the slow unfolding of events that led up to the raids and arrests in June of 1941. That included the FBI infiltration of Local 544 as early as August of 1940. They had various informants working for them as well as undercover agents. Uh, the internal FBI reports that were made in early 1941, uh, uh, FBI agents who were openly functioning in Minneapolis who were interviewing members of that anti-communist rank and file organization, those members uh, uh, making allegations of seditious statements on the part of the Trotskyists and their alleged stockpiling of weapons in walls of churches and in Emil Hansen's basement. Interestingly, no weapons were ever found or brought in as evidence in the case. 
but the allegations were made, they were put in the reports, they were sent to Hoover, Hoover highlighted them, kept sending them to the Attorney General, trying to make the case that there, there should be a prosecution here. And we see one of the things I found in the National Archives was a communication uh, within the Department of Justice where there was a, a, a decision to seek prosecution under the Smith Act uh, uh, as early as April 1941, well before Tobin's telegram. So the government was already moving in that direction. So the significance of the story goes beyond just the importance for the Trotskyists. I think the origins of the trial reveal this ex the extensive nature of such early labor anti-communist networks and it sheds light on how the FBI and the Justice Department engaged in such early domestic security work. In chapter three, I demonstrate how this case had implications for larger questions of civil liberties and free speech. Uh, in the chapter, I analyze the first half of the lengthy trial, what comprised the government's making its case, showing how US Attorney Victor Anderson, that same US Attorney we saw in the WPA trial, he's back again, here he's using the Smith Act's provisions to define the SWP as an illegal conspiracy and essentially to put socialism on trial. On July 15, 1941, a federal grand jury indicted the 29, James Cannon, Grace Carlson, Jake Cooper, Oscar Coover, Harry DeBoer, Farrell Dobbs, Grant Dunn, Miles Dunn, Vincent Raymond Dunn, George Frosig, Albert Goldman, Max Geldman, Walter Hagstrom, Clarence Hamill, Emil Hansen, Carlos Hudson, Carl Kuhn, Felix Morrow, Roy Organ, Edward Palmquist, Kelly Postal, Ray Rainbow, Alfred Russell, Oscar Schoenfeld, Rose Seiler, Dorothy Schultz, Carl Skoglin, Harold Swanson, and Nick Wagner. The first count of the indictment was brought under an old Civil War insurrection statute, and that charged the defendants with having engaged in a conspiracy to overthrow the government by force to actually have taken uh, attempted action at this. The prosecution attempted to make its case by pointing to the Union Defense Guard, but not a single defendant would be found guilty under that charge. The second count was brought under the Smith Act and constituted the sedition charge against alleged seditious speech, publications, and associations. When the trial opened on October 27th, only 28 defendants were present because Grant Dunn had committed suicide on October 4th. Uh, even before the tr they entered the courtroom then, the Trotskyists suffered a devastating blow. Um, and Farrell Dobbs, who spoke at Grant's funeral, essentially attributed, as best anyone could ever understand, a suicide. He uh, tried to make sense of it by pointing to what we would now call Grant Dunn's PTSD from his service in World War I, as well as the pressure he was under since the indictment. Um, when the trial began, the prosecution's logic, as articulated by U.S. Attorney Anderson in his opening statement, was that it planned to demonstrate that the accused advocated Marxist ideas that were in themselves inherently unlawful because, according to Anderson, they depended on the advocacy of violent revolution. This was their interpretation of the political beliefs, that you couldn't detach them from the advocacy of violent revolution. Thus, the crux of the government's argument that was that the party and the Marxist ideas it was founded upon were illegal under the Smith Act. And it was in this sense that socialism was put on trial. The prosecution deemed the SWP a revolutionary party that would use force to achieve its program, be that through the infiltration of the armed forces or the creation of a special union defense corps. And thus, it contended that any of the defendants knowingly connected with it was guilty of conspiring to violate the Smith Act. As I show in this chapter, the government relied heavily on the testimony of men like James Bartlett, who took the stand seven times, and on selected excerpts from SWP publications to define what those allegedly advocated Marxist ideas were. At one point, the prosecution even allowed Bartlett to testify that class warfare was the gist of one of the party pamphlets. Once the prosecution rested, the defense immediately filed motions for directed verdicts of not guilty, on both counts on the grounds that there was not enough evidence presented at the trial. Judge Joyce dismissed those motions but ended up issuing directed verdicts of not guilty for five of the 28 defendants, Hagstrom, Schultz, Seiler, Frosig, and Wagner, arguing that there was not sufficient evidence to go to the jury and not sufficient evidence of knowledge of the party by such defendants. So while these five were set free, the judge did not dismiss the application of the prosecution's conspiracy charge. That logic still remained out there. 
And Joyce also showed no sympathy for the protective application of the clear and present danger test to the other defendants, which was something, as we'll see in a minute, Goldman was trying to argue for the defense. Instead, Joyce said uh, at this juncture in the courtroom, it may seem unreasonable to fear when the size and power of the United States is considered that this comparatively small group of individuals could accomplish successfully, successfully the objectives charged. But it is well to remember on this point that Hitler went around in a greasy raincoat in his early days and was belittled for his efforts. The law is there. It binds all, and any two or more who break, it, break its provisions are amenable to its penalties. So the Trotskyists really had an uphill battle to fight when they came into the courtroom, when they began their defense. And I explore those efforts uh, led by Albert Goldman in chapter four. And Albert Goldman's picture here, um, the coffee cup. The defense team saw the trial as an opportunity to, to fight not just for free speech, but also for trade union democracy and for the legitimacy of the SWP. The defense contended that the SWP was a legitimate political party and that its members, including those in local 544, had a protected First Amendment right to advocate their beliefs. Denying that they had engaged in overt acts of rebellion or had advocated such illegal behavior, Goldman insisted that the defendants were innocent and intended to use the clear and present danger test to make his case. Their argument drew from a relatively new interpretation of free speech theory, however, uh, it just had fairly recently been embraced by many civil libertarians in response to the first Red Scare, that is, a protective application of the clear and present danger test. Um, but it was also based on a set of ideas that some Americans were coming to abandon or at least alter in the face of the new wartime crisis when the perceived gravity of threats outweighed speech protections, and that's sort of where Biddle had gone, okay? The reliance on the protective application of the clear and present danger test um, was also something that the Supreme Court had not yet invoked to restrict federal restrictions on speech. So drawing on such a theory for their defense was a strategy that only proved partially successful, but escaping the charges was not their prime concern. Rather, it was remaining true to their revolutionary principles, using the courtroom to herald those beliefs, and defending their right to hold them. I examine their efforts in this chapter by describing the testimony of four key witnesses. There were more, but I focus on the four key witnesses. James Cannon, pictured here with the cigar, uh, spoke to the nature of the party and its core principles. In his famous exchange with Goldman, he corrected the misrepresentations of the party that had been advanced by Bartlett, and the other prosecution witnesses. Similarly, uh, Farrell Dobbs and Vincent Dunn, Ms. Dobbs and Dunn is, oops, sorry, Dunn here, uh, took the stand to clarify for the jury what the SWP's relationship was to local 544 and to trade unionism in general, refuting the claims made by Bartlett and the others that they had made the union into an arm of the party and planned to organize strikes to spark a revolution in the context of the deepening war abroad. And lastly, Grace Carlson, the only remaining woman defendant, spoke to the legitimacy of the SWP as a political party that ran candidates like her and her sister Dorothy uh, for office in an attempt to educate the workers in the necessities of socialism. In his lengthy 10 hours over two days closing statement, and I thought of that as I recently served jury duty. I was very glad that the attorneys did not give a 10-hour closing statement. <laughs> Goldman drove home the defense's ultimate position when he stated, we do not ask you to agree with us. We have not asked you to throughout the trial. We ask you only to permit us a chance to go on and teach our doctrines and our ideas, and a verdict of not guilty will mean not only that you recognize the Bill of Rights in the Constitution, not only that you recognize the evidence, not only that you take into consideration our contention that we do not advocate but predict, and they were re referencing violence, that they don't advocate violence, but they, they predict violence will come when capitalists oppose the change and they are the ones who will engage in the violence. Goldman says, if you keep that in mind uh, and render a verdict of not guilty, it, it will mean that on your part, you have struck a blow, a blow for the opportunity to transform the chaotic world in a peaceful way. The greater the democracy, the greater the chance is for a peaceful transformation. Give us that chance, for you cannot stop our voices by putting us behind bars. The conditions demand those voices, and the voices will be heard. The jury, however, was not convinced. On December 1st, it came back with the verdict, 
Five of the defendants, Miles Dunn, Ray Rainbolt, Roy Organ, Harold Swanson, and Kelly Postal, were acquitted of all charges. The remaining 18 defendants were acquitted on count one, but were found guilty on count two. Perhaps because the Smith Act allowed for up to 10 years in jail and a maximum fine of $10,000, the jury recommended leniency in sentencing. That sentencing took place on December 8th, 1941. As Dobbs later remarked of the timing, we thought that judge would put us away so deep they wouldn't find us until some archeologists 300 years from now start looking to see what's under the dirt. For a group still staunchly opposed to the war and now convicted of sedition, entering the courtroom on December 8, 1941 was, uh, for sentencing was a daunting experience, but they faced it as they had faced every challenge along the difficult, this difficult role bravely and together. Most of the defendants received 16 month sentences Six received sentences of one year and one day. As I show in chapter five, the 18 did not begin these sentences immediately for they continued to fight the conviction during a lengthy appeals process uh, that lasted from December 1941 until December 1943. With the support of the ACLU, which had positioned itself against the Smith Act from the very beginning since the hearings on the bill before the House and Senate in the summers of 39 and 40, the SWP and its newly formed Civil Rights Defense Committee, the CRDC, led by George Novak, spearheaded the fight. Through the issuing and sale of pamphlets detailing the nature of the 18th case and the threat it posed to civil liberties for all Americans, and through mass meetings and petition drives among unions, these groups worked to raise funds for the defense and to build support for the appeal. And they were also working for the repeal of the Smith Act. In these same years, as I explore in chapter five, the full implications of, of the first Smith Act case for the presence of the Duns and other Trotskyists in the Teamsters Union became clear. Weakened financially and distracted by the prosecution and appeals process, they became easy targets of Tobin's campaign to seize back control of the drivers. And remember, they were the two locals. Local 544 CIO was the uh, bulk of the membership there was about 6,000 members in the union. The bulk of them went with the Trotskyists out of the IBT AFL into the CIO, okay? They were struggling against the rump local 544 AFL that remained loyal to the IBT, loyal to Tobin, uh, and you had Brennan and Bartlett, Williams had passed away of a heart attack at this point, uh, involved in that local. And it was not just a simple struggle over who would get bargaining rights. It was complicated by the federal sedition prosecution. The leadership of 544-CIO were convicted under the Smith Act during the time, these months, where they were struggling for control over the drivers, who would represent the drivers. Uh, the use of heavy-handed tactics by organizers sent into Minneapolis by Tobin beginning in July of 41 and continuing into the fall, and that included Dave Beck, who was sent out, uh, and a young Jimmy Hoffa, who came down from Detroit to persuade the men to sign up with the AFL. Uh, and this, also, the state labor conciliator, who had close ties to Sidney Brennan, one of the leaders of the Committee of 100, uh, and uh, bragged about talking to William Green, who had a link to Roosevelt, the state labor conciliator, not surprisingly, decided that it was local 544 AFL, not CIO, that had the bargaining rights. And he made that decision in September. Uh, um, so at that point, um, the Local 544 CIO was losing ground. By the spring of 42, when a judge upheld the state labor conciliator's decision, uh, they decided they had to disband. Dobbs said it was, didn't make sense to go down the road of unnecessary victimization, and, and he meant that in every sense of the term because people were being uh, physically harmed. Um, the disillusion of the Trotskyist presence in Minneapolis, uh, the Minneapolis-based Teamsters had real implications for the drivers there, and you can see it in uh, some of the um, contracts that were um, reached in this period when 544 CIO was still functioning. Um, one example I found, they were able to get a 14 cents an hour wage increase uh, for the workers they were representing, uh, whereas 544 AFL only got six cents. Um, and they were doing sweetheart deals and the employers loved to take advantage of this. They would say, oh, we don't know who to bargain with. Oh, you know, and they dragged their feet. And so it was really hard. But the ultimate takeaway for the workers is they really lost out when the Trotskyists were removed because 
the remaining leaders were more conservative. It's kind of the inverse of the rank and file here was, were the radicals, the rank and file in Minneapolis, opposition movement that I'm looking at were anti-communist conservatives. Um, this raw deal for workers in the New Deal serves as an example of what could happen to the more revolutionary visions within the labor movement when the state aimed its legislative powers at them. Uh, and it kind of takes you back to the pre-New Deal era when workers were wary of what the state could do, I think. Um, ultimately, the 18 failed in their appeal at both the Eighth Circuit Court, which upheld their convictions in September of 43, and the Supreme Court, which refused to review the case in December of 43. Uh, the 18 then had to, headed to jail to begin their lengthy sentences. And this is the photo of them processing uh, in formation to uh, turn themselves over to begin their sentencing, sentences. Excuse me. In chapter six, I explore what life was like for the imprisoned defendants as they served their terms. Uh, uh, the lengthiest sentences went from December of 43 till January of 45. And I followed their struggle to restore their civil rights in the years immediately after their release. In this chapter, I continue my exploration of the broader implications of the case for First Amendment rights, noting that this was a concern that contributed to the ability of the 18 to build an impressive alliance with the ACLU, the NAACP, and the March on Washington movement, and over half a million progressive trade union members. They were concerned about what this law would mean uh, for them. Among the many letters that flooded the White House at the time demanding a pardon for the 18 included one in which its author called out the hypocrisy at the center of the Smith Act case that was particularly glaring in the context of World War II. He argued that it is a poor thing indeed when our soldiers are dying on the battlefields in a war for the four freedoms that those very freedoms should be outlawed here at home. In the context of the emerging Cold War a few years later, Farrell Dobbs and Grace Carlson when they ran for president and vice president on the SWP ticket in 1948, similarly pointed out the disjuncture between the nation's stated principles of freedom and their continued inability to achieve a presidential pardon. But such a reprieve was not to be, and indeed things went from bad to worse, as I examine in the first half of chapter seven, the final chapter, where I trace out the negative impact of the Dennis decision on the Trotskyist attempts to secure a presidential pardon and repeal the Smith Act. The, the Dennis decision uh, was when the Supreme Court upheld the Smith Act and the convictions of the CPUSA leadership. Uh, those leaders were convicted under that law in 1949. They appealed. It reached the court by 1951. Uh, in, in, a, in really the depths of the Cold War, Korean War was raging. The Soviets had achieved the bomb. China had fall, fallen to communism. It wasn't a good time for them. <laughs> um, and the court upheld the legitimacy of the Smith Act, really weighing in on um, the gravity of the danger. That imminence wasn't even necessarily significant. It was the gravity in, in Vincent's decision in the court there. So this made it really hard for the Trotskyists who were trying to repeal the Smith Act when the court, court just made what it felt was a strong case for the reason why this law should remain in place. Uh, the floodgates opened to additional Smith Act prosecutions, that whole second tier of prosecutions uh, at the height of the Second Red Scare. And in these same years, during the late 40s, early 50s, the FBI continued its intense surveillance of the SWP as a whole and of the individual Smith Act defendants. And one of the ironies of my research is a lot of what I know about what happens in these years is because I've been able to get the FBI files. So I kind of was slightly uncomfortable feeling about that, right? Um, uh, the Minneapolis Teamsters community was now dominated by that rump local 544 AFL led by uh, Sidney Brennan, who reaped the benefit of his betrayal of the Duns. Uh, and they pursued an intensive blacklisting of anyone who had ties to the Trotskyists. Brennan was just sort of um, obsessed with making sure Miles Dunn and Carl Scoglin and these guys could not work, uh, not just in Minneapolis, but anywhere they went. And if he had connections, he would reach out and blacklist them. Um, and so it made it really hard for those folks to make a living. Most of the 18, uh, including Vincent Dunn and James Cannon, uh, who are pictured here with Arnie Swayback, um, uh, Geldman and others, they remained true to their commitment to Trotskyism, despite the surveillance and the harassment and the blacklistings. But others, including Albert Goldman, 
Grace Carlson and Edward Palmquist left the party at different times for different reasons that I explore in that final chapter. Even after the Supreme Court's important Yates decision in 1957, and this is the case uh, when it, the court finally ap applied the protective use of the clear and present danger test to the Smith Act and essentially rendered that law toothless. It didn't uh, um, uh, declare it unconstitutional. It just set a higher standard of evidence that there had to be proof of incitement to action uh, for there to be uh, a, a, a conviction under that law. Um, even after the court did this, uh, the political repression of the SWP did not end. In fact, with the defanging of the Smith Act, J. Edgar Hoover sought new ways to continue his surveillance of alleged dangerous political groups. Uh, and he, in many ways, um, anticipated the Yates decision um, in 1956, a year before the court decided this in, in uh, Yates, uh, Hoover began COINTELPRO, the counterintelligence program against the CPUSA. Uh, with that no statutory cover, without a goal of prosecution, the goal was to disrupt and to neutralize these uh, uh, various movements that he felt were a threat to national security. After Yates, Hoover expands COINTELPRO because he no longer has the statutory authority of the Smith Act to seek evidence to seek prosecution. So the, the, those stories are also intertwined. COINTELPRO uh, was targeted uh, against the SWP beginning in 1961. Uh, and in many ways, it just continued the surveillance and the disruption that the party uh, had been experiencing since 1940. It sort of ramped it up and continued it. And once again, the Trotskyists found themselves at the center of this important civil liberties story. But this time, there was somewhat of a happy ending. Uh, the 1986 victory of the SWP in its lawsuit against the FBI for its use of the excessive and illegal COINTELPRO surveillance of the party from 1961 to 1976. Farrell Dobbs, who, when he testified at the trial, was 74. He's not 74 here. I just had trouble finding a picture of him later in life. Um, Dobbs testified when the case went to court in 1981. He was 74 at that point. And he traced the FBI's harassment of him and the party from the origins of the Minneapolis Teamsters faction fight in 1940 through the early 1970s when he retired as national secretary. He became national secretary of the party after Cannon. His testimony contributed to the SW's case that it had been damaged by the Bureau's actions and that its members' constitutional rights had been violated. This time, he and the party were vindicated in the courtroom. In 1986, Judge Thomas Grisa, uh, ruled that the FBI's COINTELPRO operations against the SWP, including the FBI's use of informants to obtain private information about political meetings, demonstrations, and other lawful SWP events, were patently unconstitutional and violated the SWP's First Amendment rights of free speech and assembly. And it really is remarkable when you look at the number of informants. At one point, I think 11% of the party members were informants. And it was really kind of radical, you know, blows your mind, you know. Um, Greece's ruling vindicated the SWP, which had been a target of such violations since 1940. Although the party had rallied to a high of 3,000 members in 1945, invigorated in part by the fight against the Smith Act, the long-term disruptions of the FBI's investigations especially as experienced through the excessive and illegal practices of COINTELPRO had a negative effect on the party's ability to function. Uh, even after free speech laws had been eased and the Smith Act essentially defanged. The 1986 ruling was in some ways an acknowledgement of this almost 50 year fight. Dobbs who died in 1983 didn't live to see this vindication but he most likely would have been pleased and proud of his contribution in securing it. In conclusion then, uh, I believe the story of the Trotskyist struggle to defend their civil liberties over several decades, beginning in 1941, is an important one in and of itself. For what it tells us about early labor anti-communism, the origins of the national security state, and the resilience and bravery of the Trotskyists themselves. Yet it's also important for the lessons it can teach us today as we live in the post 9-11 era, during which the mechanisms of the national security state have been expanded and enhanced in ways that perhaps not even J. Edgar Hoover would have anticipated. As it faces continued terror threats today, America finds itself in a strange twilight zone, uh, somewhat akin to what Francis Biddle described in the months before the US officially entered World War II when Biddle argued 
it may be necessary at any time to take steps which would not be considered in ordinary times. Although the Smith Act was sustained and given new life in many ways by the outbreak of World War II and the subsequent Cold War, it was eventually reined in as the politics of emergency eased by the late 1950s. And part of the reason for the Yates decision, legal scholars argue, is the changed national and, and international uh, context. You know, the war in Korea was over, Stalin had died, there was a change in the court, it was the Warren Court now. Um, so that played a role in the defanging of the Smith Act. A period of readjustment followed uh, with the flowering of dissent during the 60s and 70s, the church committee revelations and reforms, and the SWP's court victory in the mid-1980s. But with the rise of new terror threats during the early 1990s, and with the attacks of September 11th, the United States has once again found itself in a state of heightened anxiety. America is now enmeshed in a new experience of perpetual war, but a war that is no longer defi fully defined as war, and that is conducted on multiple fronts by various means, including the expanded powers and authority granted to the nation's domestic intelligence agencies and the president. It might seem that a modification of the national security provisions that have tended uh, to abuse civil liberties will never come if the threat of another attack always looms. The logic in that trade-off between uh, speech and security, freedom and security was, oh, it's only temporary and then eventually we can rebalance. But what do we do when it's perpetual? <laughs> if the past is a guide with the persistence of committed individuals and groups like the 18, the CRDC, the ACLU and the NAAC, the AFCP, in fighting to preserve those rights, and maybe with the wisdom of the courts, although I have less hope there than when this book first came out two years ago, um, <laughs> upholding those rights with the protective application of the clear and present danger test, the, that rebalancing might take place by considering both the gravity and immediacy of possible threats to the United States. Americans can be vigilant and effective in preserving the life of the nation while they also protect the freedoms that give life to their nation. Thank you.